Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show. As people who are regular viewers will know, for the past several months, All Things LGBTQ has been promoting an upcoming series of town hall forum that being sponsored jointly by the member organizations of the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont. And joining us today are two of the people who have been instrumental in putting those forums together. And the first is the Director of Communication and Development, doesn't that sound impressive, of the Pride Center of Vermont. Welcome back, Justin Marsh. Thank you. Well, I think this is actually my only, the, only the first time I've been here as Justin. I, I think you're correct right. because the other two visits right. might have been in a very well-known persona who we will have to invite back on in the, the near future. But first, I want to start by giving a acknowledgement of the Pride Center of Vermont. If you are not familiar with the services they provide, please go on to their website and Facebook page because they continue to evaluate need and expand the services available to LGBTQ plus Vermonters. But for today, I wanna to talk with Justin about you and the Pride Center was instrumental in ensuring that these town hall forums happened again this year. Why was it important that the forums happen again and what is it that the Pride Center was hoping would be the result of the forums? Yeah, so in late 2019, I know that you and Brenda Churchill were, were instrumental in um, getting all of the, the very first town hall series going. And, um, and I was lucky enough to be a part of that down at the Bennington and Brattleboro sessions. And what was great about seeing that and meeting queer people in those spaces is that we as a statewide organization, the Pride Center of Vermont, we are located in Burlington. Of course, it's very hard to conduct statewide services from one central location, especially when it's in the northern part of the state. So for me, um, it was just really great to meet folks uh, in those counties and to have conversations with them. And so when I was finished with Pride 2020, which was so different than, of course, all the other Prides, I was actually talking to my therapist and I was like, what am I gonna do? I've sort of like, I kind of crashed after Pride and I was like, I just feel like I need something to kind of keep me sustained in this work. And um, and that it, through our conversation um, was picking this up and, and saying, okay, there's no reason why we can't do these town hall forums in the in the zone that we're in now zoom um so why don't we just i'm gonna i'm gonna try to go do this and so what i knew i wanted to do was kind of par bake the concept of course you and brenda had done so much work last year um but i wanted to make sure that if i brought this back to folks that there was enough for people to latch on to so i worked with a uvm student uh matt hagberg Berg, and Matt and I conducted this whole outline. We were going to do them all right off the bat. Actually, we would have been done by the time this is airing now um, because I, want, I was on a fast track to make it November and December. Um, and once I brought it to the group, we realized I was, I was going way too fast. Uh, so we slowed it down, we reworked things. Um, and it's just really nice to see a truly collaborative a project among all of the organizations. And um, again, the point being to really connect with folks in all the parts of Vermont. I have this thing, I started at the Pride Center in 2018 and I'm a Lomoyal County resident. And it was my, I, I, I say it probably at least once a week at work. And that's that 
we really need to work on being statewide and we need to there's 13 other counties in the state that need our work and support and services and we do our damn best trying to get out to them but we could always do better so this is this is part of that so you've talked about this being a collaborative effort which is greatly appreciated now could you talk a little bit about this year obviously because of covid it needs to be virtual events they can they cannot be in person but there was also a decision to move away from making them geographically based to issue based can you share a little bit about what that conversation was like and then what are the issues that were decided upon and how was that decision made sure so firstly, the, the collaborative effort with the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont, the main um, sort of groups that are really working hard on making this come to fruition are Out in the Open, which is based down in Brattleboro, and Outright Vermont, which is the youth organization based in Burlington, the Pride Center, and of course, Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont, which uh, Rachel will get to later. But I just wanted to put that out there that those are the kind of the main players in this. Um, when I brought it to everyone, I had, Matt and I had sort of concoct, concocted this um, very geographically based outline. Um, and we were going to do Chittenden County. And this comes goes back to my whole, like, we need to be in those other counties. So I was thinking very county oriented, um, making sure that everyone in their little part of this beautiful state had time set aside for them so that Chittenden County um, which is so different than many of the other counties in the state, didn't sort of steal the spotlight. Um, and when we when we discussed it in the group, we kind of had this idea of, and it, I, it was certainly not my idea because I, I was thinking very county oriented, but someone said, why are we sort of zeroing in on county when in this sort of atmosphere of everything being digital, we, for once, do not have those physical boundaries of, of space, we can talk about aging, we can talk about rural queerness in ways that are not tied to where we get our mail. Um, and so I think that that is, was a really, it was smart because we did shift our whole frame of thinking in the planning process. And we threw out that whole idea of everything depends on where you live, because a lot of what we were seeing in 2019 was that a lot of the issues that were happening in Bennington were the same issues that were coming coming up in St. Johnsbury. There were a little bit of differences, um, you know, very, you know, finu you know, there's just, you know, little things. And I think that what we found is that we can talk about this as a, at a statewide level and the issues that happen in one community are very apt to be happening in another community because so much of Vermont looks similar. So how, how did you arrive at what are going to be the actual issues that are going to be the focus of the individual forums? Yeah, I mean, that was quite the process. I mean, of course, as you know, but we we sort of started with everyone just sort of popcorning ideas of what are some items that seem really um, that are coming up in conversations that we're having throughout the year with community members that seem to be kind of those hot button topics that we need either more support around or more resources or legislative changes, things like that. And so what we what we ultimately, after you know, a lot of back and forth, we we landed on six topics. Um, and those topics are health justice, housing, rural queerness, youth, aging, and racial justice. And between January 21st and Feb and late February, we'll be doing all of these. Um, once a week and really taking our time in having different facilitators um, and different participants. You can participate in all of them if you want, but it kind of allows folks to to really pick and choose. You know, some people are very, very uh, passionate about housing and um, housing equity and access to housing. Um, and of course, the price of housing, <laughs> right? That's a big one. So they might want to just go to that one and they may not 
be in a place to really have a lot to learn or a lot to talk about when it comes to aging or something like that. And so they can really choose where to put their energy. If they really want to go to all of them, which like I do, of course, but it's, I'm, you know, I'm not everyone, um, then they can certainly do that. But then also we decided to do a like all encompassing caucus at the end that'll actually be on what is town meeting day here in Vermont. And uh, that's the first Tuesday in March. And we're going to have our own little queer town meeting. It's going to be great um, where we're going to recap all of those six sessions. So if you don't go to all of them, you can still go to that last one and, and get kind of um, up to speed on what was discussed. OK, so if I want to participate and I have an interest in, oh, so what were those? you know, forums again in the days they're, they're happening, you will have a link on the Pride Center site that will let me know the schedule and then connect me with registration information? Yes, we're gonna be using pridevt.org for the town hall um, as sort of a central hub. That's our, that's the website we use for all things pride in Vermont, which happens in September. So right now it's kind of just a shell of a of a website that we were using pretty heavily over the summer. And so we're gonna re rehaul that for the for the town halls and that will be kind of the central home where you can uh, register for the events and we're gonna we're gonna make sure that folks are we want the people in the room who we trust and know are part of the community and can add valuable content to the discussion. Um, and so we do want to have a, a way for folks to register so that not just anyone is allowed access into these meetings because we know how that can happen in the in this day and age. Um, and so if you have other questions and dates and everything like that, you can go to pridevt.org for that information or just contact me and I'm glad to talk to you about it. And as you had referenced, part of the conversation is that these forums are intended for LGBTQ plus Vermonters. So that, you know, in the organizing, all of the sort of security considerations are being taken into account to ensure that this is a safe space for queer Vermonters to come and talk about the issues that are of importance to them. And I know that all things LGBTQ and Rainbow Umbrella will also have links to the pridevermont.org site to ensure that people have updated information and access to registration. And with that, I'm, I'm going to move to the person who is actually our first interview on all things LGBTQ load those four plus years ago. Please oh. welcome back Rachel Desletz, one of the co-founders of Rainbow <laughs> Umbrella. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Keith. And thank you to uh, Ann and Linda for having both Justin and myself on to talk about uh, queer town meetings. This is, and it's fun to come back. You know, I can't believe you. I can't believe you've been on for four and a half years. That's a, a good run. Because neither one of us look a day older. No, of course not. We're, we're <laughs> as youthful and vibrant as ever. So since it's been a while since you've been on, you want to share a little bit about Rainbow Umbrella? Oh, I'd and love to talk about Rainbow Umbrella. I know you do. <laughs> Go ahead, girlfriend. Okay. So um, Keith, I, I know you know a little bit about this story, <clears throat> which is, you know, when more of us in central Vermont were retiring, we were less interested in traveling, you know, to a lot of times it was Burlington, but it could have been anywhere in Vermont um, to attend uh, social and cultural events. So a few of us decided uh, to get together and to really think about, you know, what's, what do we really want? And then we invited other individuals from particularly central Vermont to get together to see if there was at all number one an interest in planning events or were we doing it just for ourselves. And then also we wanted to be able to foster our community and also increase our visibility here in central Vermont. So we started inviting people in different um, towns 
and almost, believe it or not, almost everyone in central Vermont from different towns came to the meeting. We even had some people from Caledonia County. <clears throat> and so we met twice a week. I mean, twice a month, good heavens, twice a week, twice a month. And we started to organize social, political, and, and inter intellectual events. Um, and they were happening in our backyard, which was really much easier. Uh, and this was back in 2015. By easier, I meant travel time because a lot of us didn't want to drive uh, in the evening, which was a, a serious issue. So what's also worth noting about Rainbow Umbrella, unlike some of the other organizations that Justin talked about or mentioned was that we did not have brick and mortar, meaning we did not have a building to operate off. We didn't even have money uh, to be able to sponsor these events. So uh, if you think back in the 60s, and most of us who were part of Rainbow Umbrella lived through those years, it was a lot of grassroots organizing. And that's what Rainbow Umbrella, that's how they organized themselves and organized events. So we relied on members to volunteer their time. And so we functioned in a very unusual way, especially for 2015. Um, so we didn't, as I mentioned, we didn't operate out of a physical space. We relied on donated space since we hadn't applied for a grant and didn't have money. And then when a little money came in from some of the events, we then were able to pay some type of stipend. But some of these places were the usual, you know, the library, they were always welcoming, the senior center, and at times we met in our home. Um, and so the other thing that happened is that since we didn't have any money, um, we really were relying on using our own money to jumpstart a project. So it was grassroots organizing at its best. And believe it or not, that is still how we operate today. So one of the reasons um, that the uh, LGBT town forum meetings are so important is, are, you know, <clears throat> first of all, it speaks to our community here in central Vermont because of the way we organized. And it also, it's our beginnings of collective action at a local level, uh, local level. It looks a little bit different now than it did in 2015, but we're still involved in bringing events to our community. And the town meetings are really one of those offerings. So on February 18, um, Rainbow Umbrella will be facilitating a discussion on aging. Uh, which will be one of the six town meetings uh, statewide that Justin mentioned earlier. So it's that's spoke, us. I was going to say, spoken like the true grassroots organizer and activist that I've been working with and growing old with for, <laughs> long, for longer than either of us care to admit. Also, I, I wanted to do just a brief acknowledgement that all that Rainbow Umbrella has a Facebook page so that people can go in and look at what are the current activities that, that are being supported because I know there are women's discussion groups, there are book groups that are forming, et cetera. So you had mentioned that Rainbow Umbrella will be helping to facilitate you know, the forum on aging. Why a forum on aging? Well, you know, of course, when we first started, we were thinking that we were looking at events uh, and forming some type of membership that would be for folks in retirement age, or let's say even 55 and older. <clears throat> so, you know, the uh, aging is, you know, right there, the top of our list uh, and what that looks like, because we're looking at some, we want to create something that's a little different than what our parents experienced. So there are a lot of, you know, several reasons um, why we wanted to have aging as one of our issues for the, this year's uh, town meeting. And 
you know, we live in a time when the aging population is rapidly rising. Uh, and this is nothing new. This has been going on for a while. And when this is compounded with a lower birth rate, uh, you know, this could be a little concerning to folks. And so in recent years, um, the population in the, uh, the, the rise in aging population has really come into focus. Uh, and it's a great concern, especially to economists. So that, um, and, and this is not just a US phenomenon, this is, you know, a global uh, issue. I mean, when you look at China and what's happening there, you think that we would be paying more attention uh, to these issues. But looking at the US numbers, uh, because, you know, in getting ready for today, I, and also, you know, for our town meeting, I wanted it to, in town meeting, I wanted to be a little bit prepared with some numbers. So, so those of you who are interested in numbers, such as myself, you might find this interesting. But in 1950, the percentage of people over the age of 65 was 8% of the total population. Now this is in uh, the US only. By 2020, and that's the year we've just left, uh, which many of us don't regret, that the percentage more than doubled to 16.9%, and that's just in seven year, 70 years. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you look at those who are of the age of minority and those over 65, you're looking at a middle that's being squished. Uh, it's you know not as big as one would think. So, and I just read the other day that in 2015, the percentage of people over 65 will be 22% of our total population, total population again in the US. So that's almost a quarter of our population. So this does have a serious impact in the workplace, but also in how we think about retirement. I know that when I first started um, to think about retirement, I was well into my 40s. And in part, that's because I was working in the world of nonprofit, and therefore I wasn't making enough money to think about retirement, let alone save for retirement. So then I started to talk with friends, um, when I retired that is, uh, and to uh, just have a better sense of was I the only one who wasn't thinking and preparing for, for retirement. And the overwhelming majority of people that I spoke with said that they just happened to land a job that included some type of retirement package. Essentially, it was sheer luck. So, you know, and I think in part, you know, we were losing generations of people with this, you know, was part of their workplace. You know, you didn't have pensions anymore. And so um, it really was encumbered upon us as individuals to be taking more responsibility for what that was gonna look like. So now we are living at a time when the average life expectancy in the United States is 79 years. And when you look at the percentage of people living in the US, who will be over 65 in 2015, we're looking at 22% of the total US uh, population. And I just read yesterday that uh, the United Nations is projecting that in 2050, there will be 3 million people worldwide who will be 100 years old and over. So that's only 30 years from now. And, um, you know, that it really exclude any, you know, or many of the developing countries. So again, you know, you can sort of think or understand why economists are concerned that when you look at the age of minority and then anyone over the age of 65, you know, we're living a very small middle uh, so we do have not only shrinking incomes, but we also are facing a shrinking middle workforce.
So um, I think, you know, I, I think it's important that, you know, this is, we need to move forward and think about this, not only for those of us who want to retire or who are retired, but even folks who are, you know, new to the workplace and be thinking about not just now, but also, you know, at, at least start thinking or talking about what is retirement going to look like? Because believe me, when it happens, it's like, eh, it's a little scary. So in our last five minutes, Oh, no. I know because our time goes quickly. Just really briefly, you know, as one of the people who are helping to put the Forum on Aging together and, and the involvement with Rainbow Umbrella, what are you hoping that people who are participating are going to gain from their participation in the Forum? Well, in this age of Zoom, I loved what Justin had to say. Um, yeah, it's bringing us all together. I mean, you know, Vermont is, is a great state. And one of the things that I love about Vermont is that it has annual town meetings. I used to live in Plainfield and they were the best. Um, and they bring a lot of value to the community, you know, in which they're held. But it doesn't address the issues specific to the queer community. And this is really an important time. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity to really to connect with other queer folks in Vermont and to also have a place where there's uh, an equal um, place for us to be able to at the table so that we can talk about specific issues that impact us and have a voice. I mean, you know, we want to be heard. So I think that's one of the one of the greatest features. I mean, certainly everything that Justin mentioned earlier, but the other thing is, is that we're a small state. And although we're a small state, we also are divided by a mountain. So by having these forums and Zoom, it allows us to connect with folks from all over, uh, regardless as to where we live. So, you know, we have people living in rural areas and then we also have people living in urban areas. And these are two very different and distinct uh, you know, concerns and, and issues. So we want to be able to look and acknowledge at all the voices uh, and um, be able to find ways to have people have an option to be able to age in place. And this is a great opportunity for that to happen. And then the usual suspects, you know, we are always looking at, we, we uh, you know, the, the alliance, uh, has been very instrumental in bringing things uh, to the legislatures here at the state house. And when we needed, when you, uh, when we were facing, you know, the elections of 2016, uh, and we started thinking about God, we need to protect ourselves, uh, you know, to protect the rights and, and the protect uh, the rights and the protections that we had fought for and had won over the years. We didn't want to lose those. And we also wanted to be able to take a position. So we were in a prime you know, uh, place to be able to fight the bigotry and hatred that was existing and already uh, was growing in numbers. So we wanted to be able to come as one united voice, both at the statewide level and then when it warranted uh, at a national level. And, and with that, thank you to both. Justin and Rachel. I look forward to engaging in some active and inspiring conversation in the town hall forums. Again, we will be listing the connection to the pridevermont.org site where you can get additional information about the actual forums, their dates and registration information, all things LGBTQ and rainbow umbrella on our Facebook pages will have those links as well. So with that, thank you to both of you and I look forward to some interesting conversations. Thanks, Keith. Everybody, I'd like to welcome writer uh, of poetry, uh, novels, and um, other interesting forms of writing, which we'll talk about later. Welcome Celeste Castro to the show. Thank Hi, you so Celeste. much, Linda. How are you doing? Doing pretty good for a Friday night. <laughs> yeah, really? Um, I'm going to first read your bio, if that's okay with you, so people can get a, an idea about who you are. 
So Celeste Castro is an American Mexican own voices author from small town rural Idaho, where most of her stories take place. She grew up with learning disabilities, though she always kept a journal. When she was a young adult, court ordered volunteer work to help her find her way, community outreach. In 2009, she graduated from Seattle University with a master's in public administration. She began writing fiction in 2005. Her writing credits include Homecoming, Bella Books, 2017, Lex Files, Bella Books, 2018, and We've Got the Power, Brisk Books, 2018, The Taking, Bella Books, 2019, and, uh, and Prize Money, Interlude Press, 2021. That's your new book. Yep. In addition to fiction, she's a staff writer with his anecdotes, uh, an online magazine for Latinx writers, where she publishes essays and poetry. So you're, that's pretty impressive, I got to say. Thank um, you. And your new book is coming out in 2000 and May of 2019. Yep. And what is that about? Well, Prize Money is, um, I bill it as a rodeo romance. And so it takes place uh, on the summer circuit um, rodeo. Uh, it's about a, um, a two-time world champion, barrel racing world champion, um, who meets um, somebody on the circuit, uh, another character, who's an equestrian stunt woman who's, who's fresh off a black Hollywood block blockbuster and when her family needs her to come home. And so she's, she's brought home um, to take her dad's place in the rodeo. It's kind of a family run business, uh, they're, they're bullfighters. And so um, these two characters meet at the rodeo and uh, it's a chance meeting book. Um, and it's, it's a pure romance, which is a book that I, I've never written a pure romance before. I've written, you know, paranormal, uh, a fantasy, my very first book, was a, rom a sweet romance, but it had a, a little bit of a natural disaster in it. So I don't kind of count that as a sweet romance. And um, so it's got a happy ending and um, a lot of action, a lot of Wrangler butts, a lot of mentions of um, Patsy Cline and Dolly Parton and all, all those sorts of things that go along with the rodeo. I'm really excited about that one. <laughs> I really love Dolly Parton. <laughs> yeah, oh, me too. Did you see her Christmas special? I didn't, but I did see a uh, special of hers on, um, I think it was Netflix. They did like a biography or. Oh, cool. Uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, she's, she's an amazing. Cool. Yeah, she is. <laughs> um, and and you, you, you work and you do some work with Hispanic dotes. Hispanic mm -hmm. dotes. So yeah. tell us about that. Is that like an online magazine or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's an online magazine, um, Hispanic Dotes, and I saw their a tweet from from them. I guess it's been a year and a half. I think my first yeah, it's been a year and a half since I saw that, and um, I was kind of look. I wasn't really looking f for an outlet for my poetry and essays and things like that, but this seemed like the perfect outlet for that. Um, and so I submitted something to. The, their art issue, which was could be anything about art. And so I wrote about um, the art class that I took very first freshman year of college at Mrs. Mason's Art 101. And one of the um, very famous artists, Bosch, and his stuff is just all over the board crazy. And it was the first time that I just kind of saw that. And um, it kind of tied it back to my college experience and how kind of wild I was, um, took me six years to do college, by the way. And so, um, so they, I submitted it, they accepted it. And then I submitted it again, the following month, it's, um, every month has a different theme. And they reached out to me, Cindy Tovar is the, is the uh, founder, and asked if I wanted to join them. And I said, of course, I was so excited about it. Um, and just to have that a place to talk about all things um, related to my identity and and my family. My family's featured a lot in there growing up as a little kid. And my favorite post I did was a flash fiction about a memory that I had when I found my grandmother's wig under the sink. 
I was like five years old, it scared the crap out of me. And it's a great big, huge beehive wig. And I turned it into a little short story written from the perspective of a little kid who finds it and puts it on. And it's like a time machine and then go back in time and trick all their friends and be the most popular kid in, in school. And um, so that's kind of, I do some fun things like that with Hispanic dotes. <laughs> wow, that's really, that and, that, and that must be, that must've been really funny to find. <laughs> it was eh, funny. I guess that's a word for it looking back I, now, but I should yeah. remember opening. I shouldn't have been snooping. I was opening it and just, oh my God, you know, it's just <laughs> shocking. <laughs> do, do other people write for this? I mean, is it, is mm -hmm. it like a collective? Uh, yeah. Are, it's funny write to the can, write for this group or is it mostly a group of of uh already people who are already doing it you know like a cooperative or collective yeah that's a really great question so it's um anybody that identifies as latinx can write for it there's a handful of um, staff writers so those are writers that have signed on and are committed to submitting um, monthly um, and then it's open to anybody that wants to guest they just like guest um, write. So those are, we get those every now and again. There's some names I recognize that don't submit every month, but maybe, you know, a couple times um, a year, three times a year. And, um, and so we just opened it up. We had some staff writers that needed to step away for a little while. And we just added a couple of new staff writers. But you can find all of our bios um, on the Hispanic Dotes website and then a link to the, uh, the archive of our work. Very good. Mm -hmm. And you grew up in Royal Idaho. How <laughs> that growing up as a queer person <laughs> in Idaho, rural Idaho. Yeah, rural. I say rural Idaho because it was pretty darn rural. Um, Caldwell, Idaho. If you ever ever heard of it, I usually say uh, it's by Boise. It's, I want to say like maybe twelve. I'm so bad at like distance. Maybe twelve miles from Boise. So it's um, it's probably more than that. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm so bad at that. But hop, skip, and a jump from the Boise airport, um, farmland. Um, and so, you know, I remember when we got our, our first like fast food restaurant, it was a Taco Bell. So that was a big, huge deal. And <laughs> but um, yeah, small town. And we I grew up kind of sheltered. Um, my dad is a preacher. And so I'm the youngest of four. We're all preachers, kids and everything that goes along the rebellious nature sneaking out, all those sorts of things. I had, i um, so grateful for my older siblings, two older brothers and a sister who kind of helped me navigate and did a lot of partying. And, you know, I didn't really, um, I didn't really f discover who I was until I left um, to go to college, which was in Washington state. Um, and I think looking back, like I was, I was a big tomboy, I'll tell you. People would always say, oh, you have a, a really, you know, good looking son there. And, you know, and my mom would be like, oh, that's our daughter. You know, so I, I looked like like a baby dyke. I was looking at those pictures. Looking back, my friends knew um, we didn't talk about it. I just don't think we knew how back then. I graduated in um, 1997, put a little, you know, just a little insight as to um, when I grew up. But it just, we were just, going to school, just trying to get through, trying to fit in and rebel in our own way as kids do that go to Christian school their whole life. And, um, but the friends that I, that I had and I grew up with know who I am today and are accept me and accept my wife. And um, I guess it kind of, I'm, I'm glad that I have them. And I don't know what that would have felt like had I gone to like maybe a public school or there was just a lot more people, but my graduating class was like 32 people. And so it was very small. <laughs> and your parents were okay when you came out to them and all that? They, they were after a while. I think my, um, my dad was the m more accepting than my mother was. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, I think it would be the other way around. My dad's a preacher and all that, but he lives and breathes acceptance and, um, He's, he's one of my role models. I write a lot about him and his anecdotes. And, you know, mothers, we all have mother issues. I have a lot of mother issues, but, you know, you only got one mother and um, she is accepting of me and, and my wife and, you know, came to my wedding. Both of them did. And we're all, we're all, we all get along now. 
that's not that we didn't get along, but it's just, you know, it's there's there is a little bit of rockiness there for a little while. Yeah, I think, you know, that happens a lot, you know, in, in families, uh, mm -hmm. that acceptance and, you know, mm -hmm. you're lucky to get it, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. So you work um, and write. So how do you write all these great books and work? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, back before, I'm new to Chicago. I've lived here a couple of years. Back when I started writing, I lived in Seattle. Um, I had kind of a weird schedule where I worked for four hours and then I, at the University of Washington, um, and then I worked at a farmer's market. And so I had a period of time where I worked part-time during the year. And so that was really easy to make time for my writing. But then when it was farmer season, I don't know when I did that. I think I did it on the weekends and like we didn't do a lot on the weekends. And I, now I can remember some conversations. My wife said, are you writing this weekend? Because I really like to go wine tasting. <laughs> so I think I, I just kind of fit it in um, where I could. Um, and this past year, 2019, was when we moved to Chicago. And I was um, lucky enough to take that whole year off to get a settled in our new um, apartment. And so I wrote all year and I actually wrote um, two full length novels. Um, one of them was prize money and then another one. Um, and so I feel like I did a lot um, then and I'm finding now that I have a I'm working again, um, I'm finding it really hard to find time for it. And um, I don't know if it's cause I'm doing actual work from home and then like, okay, I'm done. And, you know, I get my other computer and pull it out. And it's like, oh, another screen type of thing. It's actually been kind of a, a challenge for me. And I don't think I'm alone in that. <laughs> and so you're on Zoom for work then. And like, yeah. Know, yeah. It yeah, is Zoom. hard to look at a screen day and night like that. Um, yeah, it has been. I feel like you really need a break from that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when were you married? 2016. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, in Chicago, it was, a, it was in October, and the Chicago Cubs were in the World Series, and so the sh Chicago was just crazy and fun and, you know, very, uh, ele uh, just electric in the feel of it, and so uh, we planned that. We planned for the Chicago Cubs to win the World Series uh, on our wedding, not really, but so that was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, um, Ann and I... Uh... She got her a PhD at University of uh, Madison in Madison, mm -hmm. University of Wisconsin in Madison. And we used to go to Chicago a lot. And, you know, it's one of my favorite cities. Cold, but, you know, but yeah. it's cold too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is cold here. <laughs> and uh, I also like Seattle too. It's an uh, interesting city, although it's gotten pretty expensive, I've heard. Yeah, it really has. So, um, did you find that it was easy or hard to write with learning disabilities? Do you find it, it mm. gave you some advantages or disadvantages mm -hmm. uh, that you had to overcome? You know, um, I think that I've never been short of imagination, which looking at my, my journal collection, I save them all. Um, that's pretty clear. I think the thing that's been really difficult um, is the grammar and the sentence structure, you know, I, I took English 25, 025, which is the English you need to get into college. I took that a number of times before I was able to get into the class that counted towards, you know, college credits. And I took that one three times. And I think that it just, that part of learning, like the structure um, has been, uh, I'm, I'm, feeling that now going through um, edits and how to set things up. And, and I do beta reading for other authors. Um, and I can see clearly like they're very, oh, I grew up writing, you know, and I started writing in third grade and this is so-and-so's English class. And, you know, I never really had that because it always felt like um, not a chore, but like this thing that I had to overcome. Um, but the imagination is there and I've, I like to hold on to that because when I get like that draft back from the editor, that's like the story's there, the sentence structure, that's another story, you know? And so, but, but that's okay because I think 
I think sometimes that can be fixed and that can be learned, you know, and which I'm learning right now. But I guess growing up, um, never read a lot and never did formal writing a lot, but did have an active imagination. And, and, and why romance? Uh, you're just <laughs> attracted to that or um, you don't, you know, because there, there isn't really a whole lot out there about lesbian romance. So mm. um, why that one particularly? <laughs> you know? Well, I, I just happened to, I found, um, I got a Kindle and I was like, wow, I can get books immediately. Uh, so that kind of piqued my my reading um, a few years ago and just started reading so much. Um, I I read a lot of Stephen King when I was growing up and I really liked that and that mystery and horror. Um, and I, I really don't know how I ended up finding lesbian romance, but it was like this beam of gracious, glorious light, you know, that I found this really cool genre and um, read, um, found Jerry Hill and read most of her, her work and learned about all the different authors um, writing in that genre. And I guess I really like it, um, lesbian romance. I, in terms of my own writing, I kind of bill myself as lesbian themed fiction because I'm kind of branching out to other um, types of, of stories, not just romance, but that's kind of um, where I got my start um, and the kind of books that I like to read. And the characters, I know you said they were based in Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Around your hometown. Mm -hmm. um, are any of them based on people that you actually know? Or, I mean, I know you can't probably say, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my friend Alice. But, um, <laughs> but it's kind of based on your life there and the interactions with people and um, yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't, I think what's based in Idaho is more the setting. So um, the physical landscape, what it feels like uh, to live there. And, and I have a really deep sense um, and connection with the landscape in, in the cornfields and the, and the stone fruit and the hops and the vineyards and the beautiful mountains and um, I connected a lot with nature growing up and fishing and, and being outside. And um, so that's really where I'm, where I'm coming from when I write books that are set in Idaho. The characters are like what I envision um, it could be like there. It's no secret that it's a very conservative um, part of the United States of America. And so I'm kind of populating the state of Idaho with more lesbians one book at a time. So that's kind of my secret agenda. But in terms of if these characters are based on anybody, not really. They're kind of just, they're, they, they're just there. And, I, and I, I guess I know how to give them the background of what it's like to live there and grow up there and, and, be, and be something, um, be something in terms of what they do as a profession. Um, but yeah, and I guess the experiences of a lot of them are set in nature, you know, like um, prize money is is set on in the rodeo scene lex files is set on a nature preserve um and so that's kind of that's that's that correlation uh -huh. and for my last question i'm just going to ask you um who are your influences mm -hmm. uh who did you who do you really like i mean it could be mm -hmm. a teacher or anybody or you know like you felt like helped you along whether personally or reading or in any way? Mm -hmm. I would say, um, I, I'm going to say Jerry Hill because that's when I got it into my brain that like, I want to try writing a story. Um, and, and so she's a big influence on pushing me to actually put something on paper. Um, and I also want, I, I, I think a lot of the influences and, and support that I have right now come from um, a group of individuals that beta read my work and have helped me um, be, just help me craft my stories that they're, they're there to bounce um, ideas off of. A couple of them come from um, Bella Books, which is um, Taken Shepherd and um, Cade Haddock Strong, who I met through, through Bella and through Twitter. And um, I'm so grateful for 
their their fr- friendships and also to have them to be able to bounce ideas off. We read each other's work. We explore all sorts of things. Um, so that that has really given me um, a lot of confidence, and and I know that they see have seen me grow as a writer, and I've seen them grow grow as well. Um, I also want to recognize. Um, I guess I do have a English teacher that helped me, Mrs. Pritchard, who was the third time I took English 101 and I finally passed it. <laughs> um, and so I don't know what she did, but I guess she was just very patient and um, helped me helped me pass it. And it's like, oh, I got that done. And so <laughs> little, little did I know that I would continue to write uh, or, and do it for fun <laughs> versus for college credit. <laughs> Does she know? No, I, I don't know. I, I, she might still be at Boise State. Maybe she's retired by now. Yeah. Um, well, that's, um, that's interesting. So you, why don't you tell us your books that are out now and maybe just mm-hmm. a little bit about what they're about. And um, we will have it up for people to be able to go to your website and um, order books um, and to see more about you. So just briefly, if you don't mind, um, the three books you have, and we'll have you on again when your new book comes. It'll be very exciting. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, So talk about the books now? Yeah, just just a a brief little thing. Oh, okay. Your new book, you know, your your other books. Got it. Give people a a quick synopsis about, you know, what they're about. Okay. (laughs) Okay, well, the first one is uh, called Homecoming. It's one of those where somebody comes home, they've been avoiding home for a very long time and they find love there, set in Idaho. And um, the next one is Lex Files, which is a paranormal romance. And actually this one is, is inspired from a lot of different things, but my brother, older brother told us this story about the Lake Lowell ghost, it scared the crap out of me. Uh, then, not now or anything, uh, but that that's kind of where I drew the inspiration for that one. Um, and the taking is, um, it's a portal kind of a book of portal fantasy. Um, the main character steals an amulet and it transports her to another realm. Um, and she learns that she has powers that she didn't know about. Um, and it's full of um, Fae, uh, seers and shifters and those sorts of things. Um, it's one of, I'm envisioning three of them. I got the second one plotted out in my head. Just got to put it to paper. But um, so that one, those three are available. And then i um, really excited uh, for prize money coming out in 2021, my rodeo romance. And also very excited to work with um, a new publisher, Interlude Press, and um, they have been extremely supportive and I'm really happy um, with the move uh, that I made. I also wanna plug a couple of other things. Um, I am involved in an anthology with um, a couple of other writers, a couple of them I mentioned, um, Tegan um, Shepard and Cade Strong uh, with Bella Books, it's wedding themed. It's coming out in um, June, I believe of next year. And so I have a Penny Dreadful included in that one. So it's not quite a romance, um, but it's, it's a Penny Dreadful. And then the other one, another anthology, this one is uh, with Bold Strokes Books. And it's, um, it's called In Our Words, uh, Queer Stories from Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So I wrote um, a book, uh, a short story called Pale, Ru- Pale Moon Rising. It's, um, it's kind of about a cryptid and some bird um, people that, I don't even know what they're called, but they like research birds, I guess, bird re- bird researchers, but it's about the Puchen, which it's kind of like a vampire. It's kind of along the lines of like, you know, Bigfoot and Swamp Thing and so cryptids. And so I'm really excited about those. I got a lot coming out next year. So I'm going to be very popular and um, really looking forward for these being out in the world. Well, you are very prolific <laughs> and um, very exciting to have you on the show. Uh, so We'll have you back and um, thank you so much for coming. It's been a wonderful interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to all things LGBTQ. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.